Hey guys, in this video we're going to go over everything that you need for your WGEC Biology Paper 2. Now if you haven't got it already, this is the perfect time to download the free version guide from my website and use it with this video to tick off the bits that you don't know and identify where you've got gaps in your knowledge. You can then follow that up by doing the predictive papers or doing the workbooks or the multiple choice questions to try and fill in those gaps. Good luck guys, don't forget I'm going to be here with you every single step of the way. Colonnaeus developed taxonomy, which is the study of grouping living things together. We can see on our evolutionary tree here that some things are very closely grouped together and to get to other things you actually have to go quite a long distance. He develops a naming system where we have each um, organism has a two-part Latin name and this will tell us how closely related they are. It's a bit like them having a first name and a second name, a genus and then a species. The genus will be the wide overarching type of thing and then the species will be exactly what thing it is. With each new development in biology, with each new development in genetics, we understand more and more about classifications. So our taxonomy and our evolutionary tree is evolving all the time. The three domain system divides everything in life into three groups, eukaryotes, bacteria and archaea. Eukaryotes are things that have nuclei. An ecosystem are the animals, plants, everything living within a certain area. The community are the plants and animals that live there. And they're all dependent upon one another. They cannot survive without each other. For example, the animals eat the plants. They can't survive without doing that. And the plants rely on the animals to distribute their seeds. To survive and reproduce, a species needs food, water, air, and sometimes, but not always, a mate. Abiotic and biotic factors are things that are going to affect any organism. Abiotic are non-living factors such as light intensity, temperature, water levels, pH, Iron levels, wind, carbon dioxide levels, and oxygen levels. Biotic factors are going to be living factors such as food, predators, and pathogens. An increase or reduction or removal or introduction of any of these factors can have a dramatic impact on a community. For example, the introduction of a new predator or a new pathogen could wipe out a community. An increase or a decrease in the temperature could mean that the, an organism's food source is gone or an organism can't survive in that environment. And plants and animals aren't going to be able to survive without sufficient levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Animals need to adapt to their environment so that they can survive. Cacti are well adapted to a desert environment because they have shallow roots. They have spines to prevent them being eaten and they can store water in their leaves. Snow foxes are white so that they blend in. They have small ears so that they don't lose heat because they produce a surface area and they have a very thick coat.
If you want to investigate what grows in a field, you can use a quadrat, which is going to be, um, let's say, a metre square. You throw that on the ground and count what is in there. Randomly moving it around the field so that you get a wide coverage. You're going to need to estimate the size of the field so that you can work out how much um, area there is. Work out your plant population per area that you've measured and then multiply that up to cover the entire field. A transect is a bit more ordered. You start at a point, take a line, and then take measurements at every single point along that line. Um, this could be, say, from a hedge moving away so that you are varying things like light intensity or distance from water. DNA is a long strand of deoxyribonucleic acid made up of lots of letters, A's, T's, C's and G's. And these twist round into a double helix. This double helix is still ridiculously long, so it further twists round so that it's in a chromosome. And this chromosome is located in the nucleus of a cell. In mitosis, we go from one parent cell to two identical daughter cells. The first thing that needs to happen is that the DNA in the nucleus needs to condense into chromosomes and then they need to line up down the middle. Once they're all lined up down the middle and all the checks are taken place to make sure that um, chromosomes aren't going to go astray, they can start to be pulled apart to either end of the cell. New nuclei will form and then they will separate into two identical daughter cells. In meiosis we are going to have two divisions. So our chromosomes will line up, they will sort themselves down the middle, there will be a little bit of crossing over going on. So they will swap chunks of their chromosome to increase the genetic diversity. They will divide into two, then they will line up and divide into two again. And you'll notice that each of the cells have half the number of DNA as the parent cell. Mitosis will lead to two identical daughter cells. Whereas meiosis will lead to four different daughter cells. You can remember mitosis goes to T because it has a T in it. Mitosis is used for things like growth or repair, whereas meiosis is used for sexual reproduction. So these are going to be gametes. In mitosis we are going to end up with diploid cells and in meiosis we are going to end up with haploid cells. Haploid cells having half the number of DNA as the original cell. In women the gametes are eggs, and in men, the gametes are sperm. In a plant, we have eggs still, and that is in the stigma. And then the male gametes in um, plants are pollen, and that is on the stamen. Cancer is when cells begin to divide uncontrollably. This is going to lead to lumps, which for most people, some people, is the first sign that something is wrong. And these lumps can be divided into two groups, benign tumours and malignant tumours. Benign tumours are slow and are generally harmless. Things like warts or moles are benign tumours. 
and having a lump on your skin generally doesn't do you much damage. The problem is when they are malignant tumours. These are fast growing, they are aggressive and they are mobile. So I don't mean the water on your arm or the mole on your arm is going to get up and start moving around. I mean cells are going to move throughout your body. Cells from the initial lump are going to jump into the bloodstream, move somewhere else and they could set up tumours, lumps in other places. And while a lump on your skin generally won't do you much damage, a lump in your brain, a lump in your liver or a lump in your lungs can do you quite a lot of damage. There are a lot of risk factors involved in cancer and there are a lot of things that we're in control of. Smoking has large implications in lung cancer. Diet, a good diet, can reduce your risk of bowel cancer, whereas if you don't eat much fruit and vegetables, then you are putting your bowel um, at risk of cancer. The amount of time you spend in the sun can affect your susceptibility to skin cancer. And unprotected sex... can leave you at risk of cervical cancer. Stem cells are fantastic things because they are things that have the potential to turn into any other type of cell. They have a number of different uses. For example, if you're treating Parkinson's disease, they can be used to grow new brain cells. If we're talking about brain or spinal injury, bone injuries, then they can be used to grow new bones to fill the gap. If we have organ failure, we can grow new organs or parts of organs instead of waiting and making someone wait on the incredibly long transplant waiting list. If we want to make stem cells, then we take a nuclei out of an egg cell. We take nuclei from the patient's uh, cell and insert that into the empty egg. The egg can then start to develop into an embryo. From this embryo, the stem cell are then removed and stem cells are turned into new cells. This does come with quite a lot of controversy because human embryos are going to be created and then destroyed. Um, and there are lots of religious objections to this. People just saying that life um, starts when embryos are created and people that object to the destruction of embryos. DNA is made from different bases that fit together. So we are always going to have A connecting to T, and we are always going to have C connecting to G. This is always, always, always going to be the case. It has a sugar phosphate backbone, and there are two of those which stretch all the way around the outside. There are two of those. It is a double helix. You see that the green is always connected to the yellow, A to T, C to G. The blue is always connected to the orange. And it's going round in a helical or a double helical structure. Gene is a stretch of DNA that codes for a characteristic. Genome is all the genes in a body, or all of the genes that you have. Each three-letter sequence of DNA is going to code for an amino acid. So here we have A, G, A. We start off with A, find G, then find A. So that's DNA sequence is going to code into the amino acid arginine. The next three along, C, T, G, are going to code into leucine. And this will keep going until eventually we have a long amino acid chain. This can then fold up in very complicated ways until we get a protein that will look something like that. And proteins are responsible for basically everything that happens in your body. They are the hormones, they are the enzyme, they are the cell walls. Everything is a protein. 
or dependent upon a protein. And these proteins are very, very specific. An enzyme substrate's active site is going to be very, very specific to the substrate. So if there is a mistake in our amino acid chain, if something is missing or if something is wrong, we put the wrong amino acid in there, then our enzyme, our protein, is going to fold up wrong. The mutation is going to have caused a change in the protein, which can then have a massive impact on how it functions. Meaning that it might not work properly, meaning that it might not break down what it's supposed to break down, meaning that it might not function in the correct way. There is a massive amount of DNA in each of our cells and only some of it is useful. So say this section here might be non-coding. Which basically means it's like junk DNA just getting in the way. A gamete is going to be a sex cell, so in um, humans that is a sperm of an egg. Chromosome is bundled up DNA. Alleles are different versions of genes. Dominant means you only need one gene to express a characteristic. Recessive means you need two identical recessive genes to express the characteristic. Homozygous means your genes are the same. Heterozygous means your genes are different. Genotype is what genes you have. And phenotype is a collection of characteristics that you have. We can work out the chances of a disease or a phenotype being passed on by doing a genetic cross. These are the things that I think should be laid out very formally and very properly. So mother's genotype, big R, little r. Mother's phenotype is a carrier. Father's phenotype, big R, little r. Father's phenotype, a carrier. Mother's gametes, R, 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 R. Now we can move the mother's gametes over here. R, R. And the father's down here, R. R, and then fill in these ones down and these ones across. So the mother, R, R, then this one down, R, R, the father, this one across, R, R, and then for the father, this one across. R, R. Then the offspring are going to have dominant, dominant. So they're going to be homozygous and a non sufferer. Two of the potential offspring, or half the potential offspring, are going to be heterozygous and a carrier. And then out of the offspring, one in four of them has a chance of being double homozygous and recessive and being a sufferer. Polydactyly is a condition where the people get one, two, three, four, five, six little adorable baby fingers. And it is dominant. So here we have a mother who has two homozygous recessive and five fingers and a father who has a dominant and a recessive and has six fingers. We can feel in the genetic cross, mother, 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 father, father. 
further, further. And we can see somebody who has this dominant disease, if they have um, one gene, they'll pass it on. And 50, or that offspring has a 50% chance of also having polydactyly. Cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. So as we saw in the first example, if we have two parents that are carriers, there is a one in four chance of an offspring having the disease. If um, only one parent is a carrier, then the chance of the baby having um, a sister basis are virtually nothing, apart from brand new mutation, and the chance of them being a carrier are 50%. If your family has a known genetic disease or if you have a child that had a genetic disease, you could opt to have IVF and before your embryo was implanted back into you, you could have it screened, so embryo screening or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The advantages to this are that you can test the embryo, so it only put back healthy embryos. So that chances are the baby born is going to be healthy and it is going to survive. Or you can um, have an embryo implanted which could help be a match, a genetic match for a sibling already born. The disadvantages of this is that embryos are going to be created and destroyed. And some people have religious objections to this. Your chromosomes are in the nucleus and you have 23 pairs. So that is 46 in total. I say 23 pairs because you're going to get one copy from your mother and one copy from your father. So you'll have two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, two copies of chromosome 3, two copies of chromosome 4. One from your mother and one from your father. This will allow for you to be homozygous or heterozygous for dominant or recessive genes. If you have inherited two X chromosomes, you're going to be genetically female. If you have inherited an X and a Y chromosome, you're going to be genetically male. We can genetically modify plant DNA, so we can take our DNA with our required characteristic. Whether that is a drought resistance gene, so that countries that don't get much rain and are very, very susceptible to droughts can survive that better, so that our crops are going to grow better. Whether that's um, a gene which um, produces a vitamin, so that countries that um, don't have a good food security, where food is shortage, where people are dying because they're not getting the right amount of vitamins, we can engineer the food, the rice that they're growing so that it produces more vitamins, so it's healthier, so that less people are going to die. Or whether it's just pesticide resistance, or the ability to resist being eaten by um, pests, being eaten by bugs so that yields are higher. We can take that gene and put it into our original plant DNA producing a genetically modified plant. We can add in the new gene to the plant DNA, we can produce seeds and then the farmers can grow those seeds and the plants will have this new desired characteristic. Some people don't like genetically modified um, plants because they think it's interfering with nature. Genetic engineering has brought around some fantastic advances. One of the most useful of this is the way we produce insulin these days. Previously, insulin used to be harvested from pig cells and that's what people had to inject. It wasn't very um, uh, good and it wasn't very efficient. These days, we've taken the gene for insulin, we've taken a bit of bacterial DNA, um, with the original DNA has our desired characteristic, and bacterial DNA reproduces really quickly. The insertion of the gene for insulin into the bacterial DNA means that the bacteria are now producing insulin. So we are now producing large amounts of human insulin, which is a really important point, quickly and safely. 
this is much, much better for people than having to inject pig insulin. It's made things much cheaper, much faster and much safer. If you know a pair of identical twins, you'll know that they are not exactly the same, even though their genotypes are the same. While they have identical genes, their phenotypes, their characteristics and how they look are going to be very different. Because your phenotype is influenced by lots of different things. Firstly, your genotype. So that's your DNA, your genetic information and your environment. This is going to lead to natural variation in a population. Things that are going to lead to variation in a population are going to be influences like diet, exercise and personal choice. The advantages of sexual reproduction is that you'll get a genetically diverse population. Which means they're going to be better protected from diseases. The counter to that is that a disadvantage of asexual reproduction is that you're going to get a genetically identical population. So that if a disease comes along and one plant is susceptible, chances are all plants, the whole population, or animals are going to be susceptible and they're all going to be wiped out at once. An advantage of asexual reproduction is that there is only one parent, meaning that the plant or the animal doesn't have to wait around for a mate to turn up, whereas with sexual reproduction, a mate is required and sometimes this can be quite hard to find especially in sparsely populated locations. Another advantage of asexual reproduction is that their energy is conserved and what I mean by that is that the parent is putting all of its energy into conserving its own genes. So this is like the selfish gene, it wants its genes, its genetics to be continued, as opposed to continuing putting energy into something that only has half of its genes. Making new copies of cells involves copying DNA over and over again. And if you try copying something down thousands, millions of times, eventually they'll become a mistake. And this mistake might just happen once and then get forgotten, or this mistake might be copied over and over and over again. And if it gets copied over and over again, we've got a mutation and we've got natural selection. All of these changes added together, these small changes, these big changes, this is our theory of natural selection of evolution. Of gradual change happening over time, this theory thought up by Charles Darwin, that means we are more suited to our environment. Darwin's theory is that life, or life that we know these days, has evolved over the past 3 billion years from the first life, the very, very simple unicellular organisms that were in that slushy puddle. And the way this evolution happens is by natural selection. So that random mutations in genes need some natural variation in a population. So that can be small things like different hair colour, different eye colour or big things like how tall people are. So for giraffes, being tall is quite an important thing because it means they have access to a larger range of food sources. And individuals with characteristics which make them better suited to the environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. Whether this is tall giraffes or finches with different say beaks or moths that have gone black or have gone white. And the genes for these useful, these desirable characteristics will be passed on to the next generation. Evidence for evolution comes from fossils. Um, not everything leaves fossils because fossils come from the hard parts, the bones, the soft bits are just going to decay away, so won't leave fossils. 
and we can see um, evolution happening with bacteria because they multiply very quickly, 20 minutes in some circumstances. So we can see changes, um, adaptations for natural selection being passed on and happening very, very quickly. Fossils can show us changes that have happened. and how different animals are related. From these, we can use or draw an evolutionary tree, showing us how closely things are related. So things on one branch are going to be very closely related, and the point where they branch off, that's where they became genetically distinct. When Darwin proposed his theory of evolution, it was very controversial. There were lots of religious objections. This is because he was saying that the earth was billions of years old, whereas that's not what it says in the Bible. And he was saying that we've evolved from monkeys, that we've evolved from primordial soup, and that's not what it says in the Bible. An alternative theory at the time is that acquired characteristics... Uh, so, for example, if you dyed your hair blonde during your lifetime and you had a baby while your hair was blonde, your baby would have blonde hair. Wallace worked with Darwin. They published a paper together. And Wallace was very important when we were talking about speciation due to geography. Mendel worked with sweet peas and he discovered or was the precursor to discovering genes or units of information that um, trans inherited units of information. I think we can take a second to appreciate how adorably cute these little guys are before we start to talk about the serious issue of selective breeding. Selective breeding is breeding an animal for a particular characteristic. It happens with dogs, it happens with cows, with horses, with cats, with chickens, any animals that we keep and we're looking for a particular characteristic have probably undergone selective breeding. And the advantages this are is that you get animals which have the desired characteristic. Whether it's the very flat face of a pug or horses that run fast or cows that produce a lot of milk. It is important commercially that dairy farmers have cows that produce a lot of milk, that dog breeders have dogs that look cute. However, the disadvantages to this is if you have a healthy animal who doesn't display the desired characteristics... For dairy farmers, they are looking for cows that produce a lot of milk. These are obviously going to be female cows. So any male calves that are born, they are healthy animals, but they are not showing the desired characteristic, so they're killed. Um, dogs that don't show the desired characteristic can be put to sleep, even though they are perfectly healthy animals. Thousands of dogs, cats each year are killed just because they are not cute enough or do not look like the industry standard. The desired characteristic can lead to long-term health problems for the animals. I've chosen the pug as the example here. Because of the large number of folds on their face, it squashes their little nose and it gives them long-term breathing problems. Dogs like Labradors um, are very susceptible to things like arthritis. And dogs like Rhodesian Ridgebacks, the desired characteristic is a mutation. So any dogs that are born without the Ridgeback can be put to sleep. And then lastly, we have a lack of genetic diversity within the population. So when we're talking about breeding, this can lead to a lot of inbreeding where um, brothers and sisters are bred to get the desired characteristic, which is going to lead to um, recessive bad mutations coming out more often in the population. 
It also means they're going to be more susceptible to any diseases that are going to be around because they don't have the genetic immunity. When a single species of animals gets geographically separated, And this could be because they're on different islands or there could be a mountain range that pops up in between them. Then we can now end up with a situation where we have speciation, where one species leads to various different species. And this is called speciation. Darwin saw this when he was over in the Galapagos Islands. The finches, small little birds, um, all started off as one population, one species. But as they separated out onto the islands, as they got separated from each other, they became quite different. The main difference was in the uh, shape and length of their beaks, as they became more adapted to the food sources on those different islands. So whether they had to dig down deep to get the food, or whether the food was on leaves, whether the food was hard to reach, whether the food was easy to reach. Bacteria divide very, very rapidly. Bacteria that is happy, has lots of food, has lots of space and nutrients, is going to divide roughly every 20 minutes. This allows single mutation to spread through the population really quickly. This is going to allow antibiotic resistance to really easily develop and spread due to random mutations, but if those random mutations mean that the bacteria don't get killed by antibiotics, they're going to be selected for by natural selection. And bacteria easily pass from person to person, or from animal to person, or from animal to animal, which means antibiotic resistant bacteria is going to spread really easily. Penicillin has saved many millions of lives, probably yours at some point, definitely mine. Because before penicillin, before the widespread use of antibiotics, people died of very, very common things. Going into hospital to have a simple operation most of the time was lethal before the widespread use of antibiotics. The smallest infection could kill you. MRSA is a bacteria that is resistant to most antibiotics. Now this happens on your skin, it's there on your skin all the time. If you go into hospital to have an operation you'll get swapped for it to find out if you have it. But if you do have it and then you get an infection with it, there are very few antibiotics that you can use to treat it. The development of new antibiotics is very slow. Partly because we've looked for a lot of these in a lot of places and partly because developing new drugs is very, very expensive. So companies are going to spend their time, spend their effort and their resources looking at drugs that are going to make them lots of money. Drugs that people have to take every day for heart disease or diabetes. Antibiotics you take once for maybe seven days and then you don't need them again. So they don't necessarily um, make pharmaceutical companies a lot of money but they will cost a lot of money to develop. The nervous system is incredibly complex and is overlaid on our spinal and muscular system. It consists of the brain, spinal cord, which together are going to make the central nervous system, or CNS, and all the neurons, the receptors and effectors. When you pick up stimuli, that signal needs to travel from wherever you picked up, so your fingers, all the way up to your nervous system, your central nervous system. Sometimes just stopping at your spinal cord and then coming straight back again. That is going to be a reflex. This is going to happen when you touch something hot, so you move your hand away without even thinking about it. Other times something is going to happen, the signal will go up to your brain, you'll think about it and then you'll decide to move. The nerve cells involved in this are very long. So this cell body here is incredibly long. And this can send a fast electrical signal. However, when we come to transfer the signal from one um, nerve cell to another nerve cell, Things slow down a bit because they have to cross a synapse. 
this is going to be a slow chemical signal. As the chemical has to be released, diffuse across the channel and then be picked up and then initiate another electrical signal. Homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. And to keep your body functioning properly, we need to control our blood glucose levels our water levels and our temperature. Here we have the male and female um, endocrine system, the pituitary gland. Is in the brain, thyroid. Is in the neck. The adrenal glands run the kidneys. Pancreas is hiding behind the stomach. Ovaries are kind of like hip level. And testes hang below the penis. The testes produce testosterone, which has the effect of um, growing muscles, making the balls and penis drop and grow larger. Um, increasing the rate of hair growth. Oestrogen is produced in the ovaries that is responsible for the maturation of eggs and the menstrual cycle. The pancreas produces insulin which is important for regulating blood glucose levels. The adrenal glands produce adrenaline which is important for our fight or flight response. The thyroid produces thyroxine which is important in regulating our metabolism. The pituitary gland is very busy, among other things it produces follicle stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH. The brain is the control centre. And that's going to be sending signals um, to various parts of the body. For example, to the pancreas, which is responsible for producing insulin. Um, effectors muscles um, are going to do things like moving, for example, shivering. And then glands are going to be responsible for the production of other hormones. Control of blood glucose is very complicated. After a meal has been eaten, blood glucose levels start to rise. This is picked up by the pancreas. The pancreas produces insulin, which is sent out into the blood. The insulin in the bloodstream is going to cause um, body cells to start to remove glucose from the blood. Liver and muscle cells can take the glucose and convert it into glycogen and store it. Removing glucose from the blood will cause blood glucose levels to fall. If blood glucose levels get too low, this is also picked up by the pancreas. The pancreas will start to produce glucagon. The glucose that has previously been stored in muscle and liver cells starts to return to the blood. The most complicated part of this is getting all the names right. The stored form of glucose is glycogen. Glucagon will convert that into glucose and this returning the glucose will cause blood glucose levels to rise again. There are two different types of diabetes type 1 and type 2. In type 1 diabetes the pancreas doesn't work properly. So it doesn't produce the right amount of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, cells start to become insensitive to insulin. Symptoms for both are going to be uh, 
loss of weight. Um, an increased need to wee. Being very thirsty. Blurry vision. Fatigue. So being very sleepy and hunger. Treatment for type 1 diabetes is going to involve insulin injections. Type 2 diabetes, it's going to be controlling diet. Exercise. Bacteria divide very, very quickly from 1 into 2 into 8. 4 into 8 into 16. A good bacteria, a happy bacteria, a bacteria that's got lots of nutrients and is happy with what it's doing will divide roughly every 20 minutes. So that very, very quickly you'll go from one bacteria to millions of bacteria. So that you can become very ill from um, ingesting, from getting in the cuts, from getting your skin, just a single bacteria. Because they divide very, very rapidly. A pathogen is a microorganism that causes disease. For example, we can have viruses, bacteria, fungi, or protists. And these can be spread in a number of different ways. They can be spread in the air, for example, by coughing. They can be spread by touch, uh, for example, if you have bacteria on your hands or you have bacteria or virus on your hands and you touch a table and someone else then touches that same table. They can be spread through blood, uh, sexual fluids, or they can be transferred via a vector like via a mosquito. Bacteria are going to make you feel ill because they produce a lot of toxins, so they'll give you things like food poisoning. Viruses will make you feel ill because when they reproduce, they cause massive cell death. Here we have our bacterial cell, which has its cell membrane, controlling what goes in and out. The cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. The chromosome. The DNA, not in a nucleus. The flagella, which is used for um, locomotion. Ribosomes for protein synthesis. And then on the outside, we have the cell wall. The body is rather good at protecting itself against pathogens. The stomach is full of acid, which kills bacteria. Your respiratory system, your nose, your trachea, your bronchi are full of mucus and hairs which trap bacteria. Your skin acts as a barrier which stops things getting in. And your eyes have tears which wash them out clean. HIV is a virus. It can be spread in a number of ways. That is unprotected sex. Um, sharing needles. Childbirth. That's from mother to child, not just general childbirth. Um, infected blood. Um, breastfeeding from an infected mother. The implications are devastating for someone, although. Um, Outcomes have rapidly improved recently due to the development of new drugs. So HIV attacks the white blood cells.
and white blood cells are an important part of your immune response. So if your white blood cells are being attacked, then you have little immune response. The damage is widespread and HIV can develop into AIDS where um, you is, that's acquired immune deficiency response which can lead to even the smallest infection having devastating consequences because you have no immunity against it. Chlamydia is a bacteria. It is spread via unprotected sex. It is one of the most common sexually transmitted infections in the UK. About 200,000 people are tested positive for chlamydia in England each year and 70% of those are under 25. The implications are going to be pain, when urinating, a disgusting, skanky, horrible, smelly discharge. That is going to come from the penis, the anus or the vagina. Bleeding in between periods. Or swollen testicles. The damage can be long term. It can lead to infertility. So the best thing to do is just wear a condom. Malaria is a parasite. It is spread by female mosquitoes. Drinking your blood at night. It's not quite as sexy as Twilight made it out to be. The implications are going to be a high fever. Sweats. And also chills. Headache. Vomiting. Uh, chest and muscle pains. And diarrhoea. And this can be lethal in severe cases. Your immune system is brilliantly clever at protecting you. It consumes pathogens, so your white blood cells... will engulf, they will eat anything that they see as unfamiliar and dangerous, and then it will destroy it. They produce antitoxins to counteract the toxins that the bacteria produce. And they produce antibodies so that they can recognise um, pathogens faster. I imagine most of you have been vaccinated or if you haven't at least you've heard about vaccinations. Vaccinations are given generally to children or people that are on holiday to different places and the childhood vaccination program in the UK has prevented millions and millions of deaths and further millions and millions of serious illnesses and in this country it has wiped out a large number of debilitating diseases. It is very rare to hear anyone getting polio these days in the UK because we are all vaccinated against it at a young age. The polio vaccine isn't too bad because they give it to you on a sugar cube but it is quite painful taking your eight week old baby to be injected by the nurse. A vaccination is going to contain small amounts of dead or inactive pathogens. This allows your immune system to develop antibodies. So if you get infected with the disease at a later point, your body already has antibodies to it, it can recognise it, it knows its pathogen, it knows how to deal with it and it can be dealt with quickly before you get ill. The advantages are that a large number of diseases has been wiped out, for example... Nobody gets smallpox anymore. 
or polio. And we have herd immunity, which means if a large percentage of the population are vaccinated against disease, even the small percentage that have decided to not be vaccinated or can't be vaccinated for medical reasons are going to be protected as well because the disease will find it very hard to spread. The disadvantages is that they don't always work. The polio um, vaccines, smallpox vaccines, are very, very efficient, but things like the flu vaccine doesn't always work. And it can be painful, and there can be side effects. You may have heard about um, a controversy where somebody linked the MMR vaccine and autism. This is completely untrue. There is absolutely no link between these two. Because bacteria divide so quickly, in a good conditions, they can divide once every 20 minutes, they are going to be very, very susceptible to mutations in their DNA. Completely random changes, which means completely randomly, one tiny bacteria could develop a resistance to an antibiotic. And it only needs one bacteria out of a large collection to become resistant to the antibiotic for it to become a problem. Here we can see an antibiotic sensitivity test. These are the discs with antibiotics on it, and you can see the bacteria is growing all the way up to these discs, but not all the way up to this disc here. So the role of antibiotics is to kill bacteria. Because the bacteria divide so quickly, mutations can quickly develop. If to the course of any antibiotics, any non-resistant bacteria will be killed off. And any resistant bacteria will survive and grow. This is natural selection in action and soon only resistant bacteria will be left. This is a problem because we are running out of antibiotics to treat um, common complications with. For example, um, tonsillitis um, is easily treated these days. Small infections are easily treated these days, whereas previously they might have been lethal. We use antibiotics far too much. They are given to animals um, daily, habitually in their feed. And this is driving the natural selection, driving the bacteria to mutate. Well done guys, excellent work for making it this far. The rest is biology only. So if you're doing combined science, uh, well done, you can go and have a relax or try some quick fire questions or go through the revision guide. Here we have our beautiful picture of the eye. The sclera, which is the white bit. The retina, which is where the image is focused. The optic nerve, which sends message to brain. The ciliary muscles, which change the shape of the lens. Uh, the cornea, which is a protective covering. Pupil lets light in. The lens is responsible for focus. And the suspensory ligaments hold the lens in place. If you are short sighted, you can't see. distant objects and if you're long sighted you can't see close objects. In an eye that can see correctly the lens will take the light and will focus the image on the retina whereas someone that is short sighted the image focuses before the retina and someone that is long sighted the image focuses behind the retina. To correct short sightedness we need a diverging lens and to correct long sightedness we need a converging lens.
Phototrophism means something is going to grow towards the light. Geotrophism or gravitrophism means something is going to grow towards gravity. Meaning your roots are always going to go downwards and your shoots are always going to go upwards. Gibberellins are important for growth. Um, ethene is important for ripening plants. And auxins are important for growth and they're going to do growth in the right direction. The kidneys have three functions. They remove urea. They control the iron content. And they control the water content of the blood. There are three ways we can lose um, water from our body. In urine. In sweat and when we breathe out. It's important to control the level of water in the body because there is, there's too much water, it's too much water taken up by cells by osmosis and they might pop or if there's not enough water then the enzymes, the functions, the reactions won't be able to take place. There are three steps to the way that the kidneys function, ultrafiltration, reabsorption and then the release. Blood enters the kidneys under high pressure and water, ions, urea and sugar are going to be squeezed out into the capsule, which is at the start of the nephron. As this all flows along the nephron, useful things are reabsorbed. All of the sugar is going to be reabsorbed via active transport. Some ions, the amount of ions that we need, the type of ions that we need, are going to be reabsorbed by active transports. And enough water that we need is going to be reabsorbed. The hormone that controls how much water is going to be absorbed is ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. And then anything that isn't reabsorbed is going to come out as we. If kidneys aren't working properly, a person can undergo kidney dialysis. The dialysis machine will take over the function of the kidneys. But it is very time consuming, it takes about four hours and has to be done three times a week. So this has a huge impact on someone's life and is not a lot of fun. An alternative to dialysis could be a kidney transplant. But these come with very long waiting lists and there is always the risk of rejection. If you want to produce an uncontaminated culture of bacteria, moving your bacteria from one place to another, you first need to flame your inoculation loop so that it is red hot. This makes sure it kills everything that is on there. You need to make sure that you open your bottles near the flame so that no further contamination can get in there. Open the lid as little as possible, flaming the lid as you go. Work as quickly as possible to transfer the sample of bacteria that you've picked up into your uncontaminated broth. I'm working as quickly as possible so that you don't get any other bacterial contamination. You can then leave the sample at um, 37 degrees if you've got an incubator or just leave it on the bench at 25 degrees um, for a few days and your bacteria will grow. I've done a much longer video explaining this, as you can see in set here, if you want to go and have a look at that, it's in the playlist with all of the other required practicals. When we are going to be looking at the effect of antibiotics or antiseptics on how bacteria grow, we need to make sure that our work area and our hands are clean. Because even though these um, bacteria are relatively safe to use, we have to assume they're going to be pathogenic. You need to make sure you've labelled the underside, not the lid, of the agar plate. 
and these plates will probably already be seeded for you by the technician. You can put your little filter paper discs on there, use forceps to do this, and then incubate them on 25 degrees for 48 hours. We can, then we can then measure the clear zones in two different directions. Here the clear zone is slightly hard to see, but hopefully if you look close enough you can see it. It's better if you measure the diameter, but in this case the only thing that I could do was to measure the radius because the clear zone was so large. Here we have our lovely little mouse who's going to be vaccinated and this is what's going to start the formation of antibodies. After a while, cells from the spleen of the mouse where the antibodies are formed are collected. We can take a known cell line, a cancerous cell line, myeloma cells and we can fuse them together. After the antibodies and the cancer cell line have been fused together, we end up with a hybrid cell. These hybrid cells can be grown in culture in a laboratory until we have lots and lots of them. After they've grown up, the cells can be taken and the cells and the antibodies can be separated. The antibodies can then be used for various different things like pregnancy tests or cancer detection. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.